U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relations program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area and others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. Now, here is Herschel Ligon, president of the 4th Congressional District of the NFO. Welcome to another NFO program from Nashville, Tennessee. NFO is a national organization of farmers who are determined to receive a fair price for what they produce. By fair price, we mean a price that will cover cost of production plus a reasonable profit, which every businessman has to have if he's going to stay. Today, we have a beautiful program from Wilson County, Tennessee, Mrs. Jean Slater. From DeKalb County, Tennessee, Mrs. Ralph Rowland. From Marshall County, Tennessee, Mrs. Avis Hunter. From Trigg County, Kentucky, Miss Mary Louise Jones. Mary Louise is uh, the daughter of a county president in Kentucky. She's the niece of a outstanding NFO member who farms 5,000 acres. Mary Louise is a teacher of language arts right here in Metro Nashville. Mary Louise, we know that the economy of the nation depends on the economy of agriculture. We'd like to have a lady's viewpoint of this situation. Thank you, Mr. Ligon. I've been doing some reading uh, by a research analysis by the name of Mr. Arnold Paulson. He's from Minnesota, and he's been doing work on where wealth originates. Uh, throughout the 50 states, we know that efforts are being made to secure new industry to help pull up the per capita income of each state and try to get us out of some of this existing economic mess. Now, even though uh, this survey was taken in Minnesota, I think there are many principles that are applicable to our situation. Now, one of the results of Mr. Paulson's survey was that agriculture was the largest industry that they had, but that this industry was sick and dying. And usually when we consider the farm pro uh, problem, we always talk about it and say, well, it's just for the farmer to consider. But it's time that we stop to realize that there are going to be more people affected than just the farmer himself. Now let's turn and take some specific examples because it always makes things clear to uh, get a picture of this and see what he found in Minnesota. They were having some new plants in Minnesota which should start about a $50 million payroll through the, uh, the uh, state. Well, now this is uh, quite a boom to the economy, $50 million. But those same plants, even with this astounding amount of money flowing through, it will take those plants 40 years to replace what agriculture lost last year. And it will take those uh, same ones 300 years uh, to replace what they lost in the past 14 years. Now this is in, you see, Minnesota just alone. So you can imagine these figures would be rather astronomical if we looked at them on the basis of the entire nation. Now, it's right, people really don't realize that this is happening in agriculture. Now, the reason they don't realize it is that we never see an actual balance sheet on our states. We don't see a profit and a loss situation. We need to do this. We, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where we've been because we, we're just sort of flying blind through this without uh, seeing any results. Let's look at what agriculture has contributed. As a total, we have a $237 billion investment in America. Now, we think of our corporations and their investments, but now this is equal to 60% of the total investments in America. Now, in 1966, we realized that the national income was up. It was uh, $590 billion. Now, this is quite an increase over 1950, but even though this income increased, the farmers income did not increase at all. Now you can see why we get into such an economic mess. As you know, money, where to get it and how to keep it flowing through our community is always a topic of conversation, of discussion on every level. At governor's conferences, you find people talking about, well, how are we going to finance education? Where are we going to get money for our roads and things like this? Now this tells us, this is a clue as to our nationwide economy. 
if the states are in trouble, if they're looking for ways of increasing revenue, we can realize that our federal government is also under the same problem because the federal government can be no stronger than the sum of all its components. According to figures based on an average period from 1946 to 1950, agriculture has been underpaid $421 billion in the last 15 years. In other words, agriculture has remained dormant. The rest of the economy has moved on, prices, is, prices have gone up, but we've just stayed the same. And this is rather shocking, so listen closely to this. We actually receive less pay today than in 1950, and yet we eliminated one million farmers. There are one million less people to share all the money with, and we still are making less than we did in 1950. So our income situation has not improved. Now, as I said at the beginning, when we need to realize that this is a problem for not only the farmer, but for the businessman, listen to these figures. There are 70 million people who live in towns in the United States that population is under 25,000. Now, this is 40% of the total population in the United States. Now, these people, you see, are dependent, um, maybe directly or indirectly, upon agriculture's gross income. Now, this makes quite a, a, a difference when you stop to think if the family farm fails, then these businesses are going to go right down the drain with it. Uh, in the 12 central states, as you think of our farm belt, last year they lost $32 billion of new income, and the only reason they lost this was because of their underpaid farmers. No wonder we have tax problems. No wonder our per capita income is low in all these areas. Think of all the money that should be flowing freely through the country that just isn't going. I think part of the problem is that we've just been brainwashed into thinking that, well, we're really living in an economic boom. But as Mr. Paulson states, I think we're all going to the poorhouse driving a Cadillac. Now, it's true, we do have more bank deposits, we're buying more appliances, we're buying more cars and things, but, but that's, that's not all of the situation. If, if we're going to go back to this uh, making a, a balance sheet of our profits and our, our loss, we need to take all the components in the situation. And these people who have been concerned in painting you a bright picture are only telling you one side. Think of the fantastic amount of debt that we have accumulated. Uh, it's, so, it's so large that we can't even have any conception of, of how great it is. But we are told that our federal debt, though, actually is getting smaller in relation to the amount of money uh, that we're making. Okay, so I, I'll agree with that. Let's just say that that's, that's fine. Let's just forget for a moment all federal debt, all state debt, municipal debt. Just say, zoom, it doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. But let's think about the type of debt that's always the bad guy, always the villain the one who causes your depressions and your recessions. Now, this is private debt. Now, in 1950, the private debt in the United States stood at $200 billion. But by the first quarter of 1966, we had a personal debt of $910 billion. That's quite a large figure. Now, as far as where our money goes, if you have a pencil and paper, you might want to take this down because you're going to probably find yourself like I did and not believe this when you first hear it. These are interesting figures. In 1966, taking one tax dollar and seeing where it goes, now 37 cents, now here's your first 37 cents out of the dollar. This goes for taxes, your federal tax, state tax, or local tax. Okay, then 20 cents went for interest on money that that you uh, owe. And then 20 more cents goes to repay the principal. Okay, now there's 77 cents out of every dollar that's gone before you hardly get your hands on, on the money. Now this leaves you 23 cents to go out and have a good time to buy food and clothes, medicine, send your children to school, and actually we're supposed to remember that a dime of that dollar is supposed to go to the Lord. So somebody's not getting a fair end of the deal along, along the way. So what do we do? We can't live on 23 cents. Well, here's what we always do. We go and we say, more credit. We must have more credit. Did you know that last year, 50% of all the goods and all the services that were uh, bought 
in the United States came on credit. Okay, now we're faced with the problem. We're already out of money. Now how long is our credit going to last? But the thing is, you say, well, out of money, why are we out of money? Well, think back a minute. Remember, as I was talking about those 70 million people who live in those communities, now, they're dependent upon agriculture. Well, now, in the first place, they didn't get their share of the money that should be flowing through the economy. This means that the banks don't have the money in these areas. They're not able to support these rural communities. So they have to look for, to the federal government for, um, for money to carry on. Now, this is where uh, the business people must come to realize that they actually have a larger stake than does the farmer himself. They, they must be made to realize that the agricultural industry is a great source of wealth if treated properly. But the thing is that we can't really deprive the farmer of 50% of his income and then expect for the rest of the economy just to go on just like nothing had happened. Let's take an example. Say we went to Detroit and we took all the um, automobile workers and we cut their salary in half. And we said, oh yes, but you still have to pay the same rent and you still have to pay the same thing for your groceries and everything's the same. Well, what would happen to those states? Well, you could see that immediately it would paralyze the economy. Well, that's actually what we've done here. We've taken one of our largest industries and we forced it into this paralyzed, crippled condition because we're asking it to operate on 50% of what's right. Well, okay, now we've heard the problem. Well, well, why is the farmer operating on this 50% of what's right? And to sum it up in a phrase, you can actually say it's that old, tired, worn-out expression, what'll you give me? This is what the farmer says when he goes to the market, just what granddad did. And we're not content to drive around grandfather's car or have the appliances that grandfather had, and we must see that this marketing arrangement isn't working. You don't go into a store downtown and see some item that you want, and the man doesn't come up and say, oh, well, wonderful, I'm glad you want this. How much will you give me for it? He says the price is a certain amount, and you pay that, or else you don't get this. Well, this is where NFO walks in and fits the picture perfectly. NFO is collective bargaining, a big phrase which merely means uniting our efforts behind one single idea, and that idea is to save the family farms of rural America. Uh, in closing on this, I'd like to make another quote from Mr. Paulson. And he says, we've been living in a fool's paradise. We've been sleeping as long as Rip Van Winkle and just as sound. And we've got to quit acting like an ostrich and pull our head out of the sand. And if we don't, we and our rural way of life will perish. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Louise. Well, ladies, I think you see the economic picture now. Going to talk with Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter is from Marshall County. She and her sons farm 600 acres. The reason I say she and her sons, she says she's gone to the barn every day. Her sons, Tom and Gilbert, are real good, and along with Ms. Hunter, real good NFO members. Ms. Hunter, uh, we've heard this economic situation now. Can you think of things that, uh, that you really need on the farm that uh, you haven't bought in the last 15 years that you could use? Yes, I think I could, but uh, we have bought, but we in debt for all of it, of course. All of us in debt? That's right. Think we'll ever get out? Uh, no, we'll die in debt. <laughs> <laughs> Looks that way, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, buy a new automobile every year? No, about every three or four years. Oh, you're doing real good. Uh, got a colored TV? No. Did your boys get college degrees? No. Would you mind saying why they didn't get college degrees? Well, uh, the farmer doesn't have enough money to send his boys to college. You know, that's a funny thing. Agriculture has three times as much invested for worker as industry. And we still don't have enough money to send our kids to college where they as the others do. What would you say is the reason we're not getting it? Where, 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 where are we short? What's happening to us? We just don't get enough of what we produce. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you people are dairy farmers. 
Yes, sir. And I might cite this to you. I don't know whether you stop to figure or not. I know you figure you're getting little enough for your milk. But you're actually getting less for your milk. You actually got less for your milk in 1965 than you got in 1947 through 51. You're right. Now tell me this. Uh, has cost of production gone up any? It's about tripled, I guess. Cost of production has tripled. And you're getting less for your milk than you got then. Isn't that the reason we're in debt? Right. When we got to where we couldn't make any money, we went to barn, didn't we? And that's what we did. And we just keep on and keep on. on and, and you on. know the only reason we're still here? Our real estate has increased in value to where the banks will loan us money on that. And that's the only reason. They not loan us money on a farming operation because they know we're not going to make any money. But our real estate has increased in value, so they loan us money on that real estate. That's the only reason we're here. Well, now, let's get one thing straight right here, ladies. Uh, it sounds like we are complaining. Maybe we are complaining. But let's just remember this. All in the world we're doing is telling the truth. If somebody wants to construe this thing as complaining, that's perfectly all right. But we're just telling the truth about the economic situation of farming. Uh, understand your son, you and your sons were one of the first members in, in Marshall County to join an FO. Is that correct? Mm, I think so. Well, uh, tell me this. Do you know of any other better organization than NFO? Well, no, I don't. How much time have your son spent in organizing NFO in Marshall County? Well, a uh, good deal of time. I'd like to quote right here President Teddy Roosevelt. He said, every man owes part of his time and money to the business or industry in which he is engaged. No man has the moral right to withhold support from an organization that is striving to improve conditions within his sphere. Ms. Hunter, let's hope we're going to get this thing improved. From DeKalb County is Ms. Ralph Rowland. She's also a dairy farmer. I say dairy farmer because she, I expect she does uh, a big portion of the dairy farming. That's right. How many children have you, Ms. Rowland? Four. Four children? Yes. All of them dairy farmers? Yes, every one of them. <laughs> uh, how many hours a day do they put in? Oh, about two of a morning and two or three of a night. That's five hours a day. And then they go to school. Yes. They get a little time to sleep, don't they? Just a little. <laughs> no doubt they like this, but uh, did you have any trouble getting them to do this work? Oh, they... They can't understand why they, when they come in, they have to go out and do the chores when, you know, maybe their friends don't have anything to do. It's, it's kind of hard, especially with teenagers. I know exactly what you're talking about. They don't get a chance to shoot basketball in the afternoon when they come home. No, do they? or watch the favorite TV programs. And I believe your husband was a state outstanding basketball player, wasn't he? Well, yes, he did pretty good. And this economic situation looks like it's going to keep the, the kids from carrying on in his footsteps, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, it looks that way. Well, let's hope they're going to get a little more time. I have the same trouble in my house. Same trouble, exactly. Okay. Well, um, Mary Louise has told us uh, she, she's connected the agriculture economy with the nation's economy. Uh, she's boiled it down to there just didn't any money. Uh, and uh, we farmers, uh, a big percentage of that, incidentally, we produce 70% of all raw materials produced in the world. Now, if we were getting paid for our production, we could put some money into the economy, couldn't we? Yes, we could. Well, what, do you, what, what, what things could you use on that farm there that you aren't using now? Well, we need to remodel the kitchen and uh, just several things in the house that I would like to have. But uh, when you get, do get a little money, extra money, well, it usually goes for machinery or something. Uh, I think it's rather hard for the wife of a farmer to understand uh, about these things, the extra money, you know, going for the farm things. She wants the same thing as her city cousins or sisters have. Don't you think she's entitled to it? She's entitled to them. She works harder, really, to get them. That's right. Uh, you got a color TV? No. A lot of people have one, don't they? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Looks like with your investment, uh, you ought to be well. able to get a color TV, doesn't it? <laughs> It'll be a little while yet before we're able to get one. Well, you know how that investment works. In 1965, the average farmer got three and six tenths percent on his investment and nothing for his labor. So that's the reason that uh, 
that you're not yeah. able to buy that color TV right now. And of course, uh, the, the tractors wear out. I think we'll pay, pay more repair bills than we would have if we could just go buy a new one. But we don't have the money to buy the new one, do we? No. Well, uh, can you think of any other things that you could uh, use on that farm? Paint your house every year? Oh, no. About every 10 years, and then we do it ourselves. You no, know, mine's never been painted since it was built. Uh, how much hired labor have you? Well, for the last two years, we haven't had any. Why? You can't afford to pay them. If we pay them, there's not really anything left for us. We found out we were paying the hired hand, and we were doing without. You can't afford to pay them no. what they have to have to live, can you? But I just think if you could do that, look how much money that that would be putting into the economy right there in your mm -hmm. uh, local area. It's kind of hard to understand that uh, when a, one man can go out to a factory and make yeah. enough to bring home, you know, for his whole family. But on the farm, the whole family has to work. Uh, that's six hours, really. The little one contributes right. a little. That's exactly right. But uh, in a factory or a public job, they can bring home enough that the wife and children usually don't have to work. What one breadwinner gets it done, and six of us on the farm can't get it that's done. That's right. Uh, we could uh, uh, put this money to rolling. Uh, we could buy a new automobile a little more often than we do, couldn't we? We'd like to. <laughs> there again, we pay repair bills and repair bills. We're going to be buying a new one, couldn't we? Yes. Well, um, what would you say is the solution? I don't really know. Actually, I don't think we would be able to stay on the farm if, uh, actually, the main part of the farm belongs to my father, and then my husband has already got his inheritance from his family. And without those two things, I don't think we could stay on the farm. And the way it's going, that's going to disappear before long, yeah. and then there we are. <laughs> Wonder what happened. And... Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the, I expect the average public uh, would say, uh, well, my goodness alive, if y'all don't like the situation, why don't you leave it? Well, that's a big step when that's all you really know, and uh, there's a little sentimental value there that's about right. the land. And, uh... and you hate to be a quitter, don't you? Yes. Just got a little bit of that stuff that keep, <laughs> keeps you fighting, don't you? I think we're called stingy sometimes, and I really, the farm people are not stingy. They just really don't have that extra money, you know. Right, right. Uh, well, how about your children? Are you going to encourage them to farm? No, not if it doesn't improve. That's right. Can't say to blame you. No. Well, uh, Miss Slater, you've heard us cry and testify now. <laughs> I, I want everybody to know that that Ms. Slater is not a member of NFO. I think she knows what NFO is, but her husband is an electrician. He makes an excellent salary. But uh, I think she is a typical housewife and, and professional too. Now, uh, I think she has recently discovered that uh, with her husband's excellent salary, but she just isn't quite enough money to go around. She has to have some extra money for things. And I guess that ties into what Mary Louise has said here, where that money and that dollar is going. Uh, Pat, I understand uh, recently you have taken a position as a cosmetic beauty consultant. Yes, that's right. Well, um, it's true that you need a little extra money, huh? Well, like most average adult, and I have five growing, normal, healthy boys, I want more for my boys than I had. So to get more for them, I have gone out and secured a position for this reason. Mm -hmm. to give them more than I had. So I feel that this has to happen nowadays. And uh, when you do that, why, it makes you work about three shifts in 24 hours, huh? It surely does. The kids holler, the husband hollers, and Pat hollers sometime, huh? Well, very rarely. <laughs> I feel like I am pulling my share of the load now. Bound to be, bound to be. Well, now, with uh, five children, I imagine you buy quite an amount of groceries. Oh, yes, they eat one meal a day from daylight to dark. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, what do you feel about, uh, about the price of your groceries? Uh, uh, are you crying because the uh, uh, grocery bill is too high? Well, I'll tell you a small incident that happened to me a few weeks ago. I was shopping and Donaldson at the local supermarket there, and I had occasion to encounter a friend of mine there at the meat uh, and the milk counter. 
and she picked up her milk to put it in her, her cart, and she made the comment that she was glad that the price of milk had gone down. And I was quite shocked, and before I realized, I said, shame on you. So she looked at me and wanted to know why I had said this. So I told her that I personally felt that I had rather pay the extra two cents than have the, the farmer lose the two cents, because on an average, in a year's time, that's oh, no more than $10. And, but $10 to me is quite a bit to a farmer when he's got quite a few $10 coming out of his pocket. That's right. So it, I had rather pay it if I know that the farmer is getting his fair shake on it. I'm glad to hear you say that. Well, I feel this way, and I've been able to convince quite a few other people recently towards this. Well, now, you, 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 you see now, after listening to Mary Louise here, why this economic situation is as is, don't you, when you have only 23 cents to spend for everything you have to spend, don't you? Well, yes, I also gripe when I go and see the prices, but I don't mind so much if I know they're going to keep the economy straight. But if, if it's not, then uh, it's hopeless. Well, with what you've heard here today, do you feel like it, that agriculture really is, is the backbone of the nation's economy? Well, it always has been, and it will remain so as long as you have the farmers, rather the family farmers, contributing to the agriculture. You know, uh, uh, as, as we've mentioned here before, a lot of people say, well, if you don't like your situation, why don't you quit? Well, if the family farm leaves, corporations are going to take over agriculture. They'll be so few, and none of them are going to work for nothing. So they will get together and set the price of grocers. And Pat, I tell you, you're going to have to have a lot of money when you come back, but when you go to the grocery store, if that happens. Uh, would you like to see us go on and, and, and the family farm still operate this thing? Well, it seems to be the only way and the best way. But I also feel that y'all cannot continue to do this under the present situation. Do you have any advice you'd like to give the public about this situation? Well, I advise the public to become aware of NFO and to investigate it thoroughly and to back it up. And uh, I think the normal consumer does not realize what the situation is. And I think that the public need to be educated on this fact. So I would advise all the general public to uh, read their newspapers and to investigate and to ask their friends who are farmers questions until they educate themselves on these facts and then back the farmers up all the way and stop griping when prices go up just uh, purchase the items or don't purchase them and back the farmer up we in nfo know everybody will be for it when they understand it thanks a lot ladies Report, a rural public relations program was brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and by others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces.